Hey, let's get you some uh, more conversations. Shireen is right now in conversation with Rakesh Kapoor, CEO of Rekit Ben Kaiser. Let's uh, listen in. It's clearly. That's driving Rekit Ben Kaiser at this point in time. Your stated objective and your stated purpose is to convert this into a company that's driven by health and hygiene. And coincidentally, that seems to be the ideology of the new Prime Minister as well. Mr. Modi's Swachh Bharat campaign seems to be an effort to move India towards a debate that we actually haven't had in this country about health and hygiene. So, uh, a, a strange sort of coincidence there. But what does this mean as an opportunity for you? Well, let me just uh, first of all say thank you for inviting me here. RP has had a tremendous track record of success over many decades. Uh, we've outperformed our markets, we've delivered great shareholder value and I had the incredible privilege of taking over as the CEO about three years ago, three and a half years ago and my first challenge was how is this company going to drive the same level of outperformance? How are we going to be successful in the next decade and more and what do we want to do? And the first thing we started to talk about in the company was what do we stand for? Why do we exist? What will happen if we did not exist? And it's questions like that that told us that health matters, but not just that health matters, hygiene is the foundation of that health. If I clean my hands properly, if I keep my surfaces disinfected, if I, if I follow basic hygiene practices in terms of toilet cleaning, we will live healthier lives and a healthy life is a happy life. So when we put all of this together, we came with a very simple and incredible purpose for this company, which was around healthier lives and happier homes. So it gives me great pleasure actually as an Indian of course, but as a global CEO, that my company today and its purpose and what it stands for is in some form deeply connected with what the government is trying to achieve through the Swachh Bharat India campaign uh, and, and we are, as you know, we have we've committed 100 crores uh, over the next years to galvanize uh, India and our, our efforts in India to take part in this whole movement. You know, uh, moving away from the Swachh Bharat Abhiyan to really talk about the India story, and I remember you said previously that emerging markets in the short term are often overestimated and underestimated in the long term. Everyone's been negative on India up until the last 12 months. In fact, up until the last six months, there's been sort of trepidation on whether we should invest or not invest in India. Rekhid Ben Kaiser is a long-term India investor. You've been in the country for over six decades now. In the current context, where there seems to be much more of a renewed enthusiasm to move ahead with reforms and so on and so forth, how does India now stack up in the emerging market basket, which is clearly your area of focus and opportunity? Yeah. I think for, I, I said that everyone tends to underestimate the long-term opportunity in markets like India always getting very unexcited if some things go wrong in the short term and always sometimes missing the big picture and the reason is that simple if you think about growth in emerging markets which to my mind are secular you never see linear growth rates in any market you'll always see periods of great uh, growth but followed by periods of of some compression or difficulty but if you draw a trend line between these periods of growth and, and, and depression, you will find quite a nice linear uh, movement. And the second thing is very mathematical actually. If you compound the growth rates of markets like India, let's call them double digit growth yeah. rates, over a long period of time you can just start to think about how significant that growth opportunity stacks up to be. So RB has been in India for over six decades. We have a very long term op opinion and position in India we don't look at the headlines of the last quarter of GDP growth and decide whether we should invest. We are going to invest in India. We have a very, very significant opportunity here and we will play our part. So given the kind of opportunity that you see in the, in the Indian market, give me a ballpark sense of what we could see in terms of incremental investments from RB into India across your various businesses and brands. So, first of all, we are here. I don't think we start to think about Indian investments for a short periods of time. I think we think about India not just for a, as a cent, epicenter for investment for emerging markets. I think our opportunity for India and our investment in India can play a much more and an important defining role for how we do business globally. And I'll give you a couple of examples of that. We, have, we bought through an acquisition we had made a few years ago called Paras with Paras yeah. Consumer Health. And we bought a plant actually, a plant came with it in Baddi in, in Himachal, Himachal Pradesh. Pradesh. Yes. And it was a nice plant. 
but it was not a global plant offering us global uh, you know capabilities for manufacturing high quality high end healthcare products over the last few years we've invested behind this plant this plant recently cleared fda clearance for manufacturing global brands and global products in this plant so i think our investments are not just designed in india for driving growth for our brands in india for for our consumers in india i think we are looking at india as a epicenter for actually doing business globally and our investments in healthcare plants in india is an example of that so will it be also the manufacturing epicenter because you just talked about this plant which is now fda compliant uh, is it likely to be the manufacturing epicenter because that's what the prime minister is asking investors to do well he's he's again he's saying the things that i'd love to hear make in india and we have been making in india and i as i said recently to you how do we make for in india not just for india but for the world but for the world and i think our investment in our healthcare capability is a step in that direction and we will constantly look at these opportunities as we decide how we invest when we pull our investments for manufacturing particularly we don't always do that for one country at a time we think about that capability and how it can enable us to grow our brands and our business geographically and i think india is one of those markets which offers companies like us with our deep heritage with our deep expertise with our deep knowledge of using this as a base for talent base for manufacturing and base for global expansion you know uh, you talked about the paris acquisition and and you preempted my question because i was going to ask you whether you are scouting for more acquisitions and whether it's going to really be uh, sort of you know the acquisition strategy is going to be driven by assets or the ability to bring assets like the factory that you just talked about or is it really going to be driven by the ability to bring brands into your portfolio excellent first of all we are a brands company um, and i think it's brands that actually drive value for our company so our strategic strategic determination of which brands and assets we want is built around whether they fit with our portfolio and what we are trying to achieve i just talked about being a company which is driven by a healthier lives happier homes so do we have brands here which can enable us to play that part in a much more enriching way that's one aspect the other aspect of course is a very financial one do we create value yeah. for our shareholders by paying the price we do which is in inevitably a premium over what what the what the uh, traded price might be and we look at some of those criteria to decide um that's the basis on which we bought paras healthcare because it gave us incredible brands like decor like move like dermy cool h card and so on and so forth but it also gave us the capability which came with it now we use that capability for global expansion which creates even more value so we are looking out for these kinds of assets but it has to be a strict criteria of both strategically attractive and financially attractive where we can create some value so anything on the horizon and is it likely to be in the healthcare space or in the home care space but we are looking out constantly we are looking out on a worldwide basis um and i have to say that of the acquisitions we make we reject a lot more um but i don't want to leave our viewers at least with the message that this is a question a company which is about acquisition a vast majority of our growth is organic uh, our people walk in every morning uh, to work not because they think there's some acquisition coming through yeah. because they have fantastic brands in their hands that they can create fantastic work for mm. and i think that's the bulk of our focus organic growth but then we know that our healthcare industry around the world is very fragmented yeah. uh, just to give you a context the top 10 players in consumer health form less than 30% of the total industry so this industry is going to consolidate over a very very long period of and time and you see yourself at the epicenter of that consolidation you see ourselves as one of the people who should be on the side of aggregators so if i were to read between the lines and that is the area of opportunity from an inorganic point of view that you're currently focused on it is an opportunity for us we've shown over the last many years that we are good at this good at spotting the right opportunity good at driving value from the right opportunity and i think that has given us the confidence also to then think about this on a scale that over a large number of years can be very interesting for rb so aligning your power market and power brand strategy from an indian portfolio point of view what more can we really expect now in terms of inclusion of more brands into the indian market across well, various categories well first of all i'd like to point out that our brands are highly underpenetrated the basic penetration of our brands is in many cases less than 10% 
heartache which has been there in this country for 30 years. I remember I was a young, very young person in India uh, when Hapik was being born. And, and we all worked, I mean, like uh, all Indians who lived in India worked on that all or Hapik or yeah, both. Yeah. And so have I. And I have to tell you, over 30 years, it still reached only 30% yes. penetration. So we have 7 out of 10 households that don't use Hapik. So we have a tremendous opportunity to grow our brands in India because our brands tend to be underpenetrated, which is very so exciting. What, what will drive better penetration then? Uh, and how much of a factor is cost or price? Absolutely. Because this is a price sensitive market. Absolutely. I think there are a number of factors which drive penetration. One is basic education. We grow categories and we grow brands not by actually simply marketing them and putting them on the shelves. We have to go home to home and educate people why cleaning their toilets with Harpic is better than cleaning with water or a concoction of other things a cocktail of other things. So education plays a huge role in creating categories. Then the second thing is to provide the right product at the right price with the right proposition in place. So I think RB is, a, is especially, I may say so, talented in creating categories. We've done so over a very long period of time in India and elsewhere. The amount of effort that is being is taking place, for example, in creating the dishwash category, automatic dishwash, with the brand finish and that takes place not because we put brand finish in in stores and 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 hope that people will buy actually it starts with convincing people to buy dishwashers sure. now we don't buy sell dishwashers as you know but we are the world's largest uh, partner of all dishwash manufacturers helping them design products helping them become better marketers and helping them sell dishwashers in a way that people get true benefit out of so our start of, of uh, creating categories does not start with selling brands. Mm. It starts with a completely uh, holistic dimension of how do you actually create you know, the I, right I, environment. I'm glad that you talked about the need for creating new categories because very often when you talk to manufacturers or you talk to CEOs, the approach is more product-centric and product-focused uh, as opposed to this category creation yeah. that you've just talked about. What more can we then expect in terms of new categories that Reckett Ben Kaiser would like to add in the next couple of years? What are you working on? What's looking exciting? Where you believe you're not currently present and maybe there's, you know, opportunity for you? Well, I think if, if you think about again, let's go back to our mission and purpose, health and hygiene. Uh, in just health and hygiene, there are huge number of uh, opportunities for creating new brands and new categories. <clears throat> we have a global brand in the U.S. It's called Mucinex. Yeah. Mucinex is the single largest consumer health brand in the U.S., bigger than many, many brands like Tylenol, Advil, and, and the like. It's in retail sales around a billion dollars worth. And we don't have uh, Mucinex in India, or we just sort of test marketing and so on and so forth. I was going to ask you that. When is Mucinex <laughs> coming to India? <laughs> now, what's so special about Mucinex? What's special about Mucinex is it provides an extended release uh, of active yeah. for 12 hours of cuff relief. Now imagine if you were suffering yeah. from cuff and congestion yeah. and then you have to cuff every three, four, you have to take a syrup or, or the other every yeah. three to four hours and perhaps it doesn't work as well. Mucinex has a, a very special ingredient which gives you 12 hours of relief from cuff. Has the single highest level of satisfaction rate amongst all the things that we sell in North America. Over 90% of people have used Mucinex. That's an opportunity to provide people in India a very effective product which helps them live their lives healthier and better. So like Mucinex, what else from the global portfolio are we likely to see being brought in? Well, we have Shoal, a foot care brand, which is still very, very small in India. Um, we have a Neurofen, which is an analgesic brand, again, almost non-existent. So uh, we don't have to look elsewhere. Mm. Our global both portfolio of health and hygiene brands offer us a huge opportunity for brand expansion and brand presence in, in India. Just as far as the health segment and the regulatory environment surrounding health in India, you know, this matter of price control, and we've now seen the government go back on an earlier order which brought more drugs under price control, but how concerned are you about the regulatory environment in India when it comes to pharmaceuticals and health? Well, first of all, I won't like to single out India, although I'm talking in India. I think the health regulatory environment around the world requires a big shake-up and RB is actually going to play a leadership role in bringing together multi-stakeholders to come together to actually shape the right regulatory policies on a global basis. It would maybe come as a surprise to you that the healthcare policy on, on what we can sell in US is not the same as what we can sell in the UK or even the rest of the European markets. So India is 
another Market dimension, with, yeah. another yeah. dimension of the same issue. So that's one aspect, which is how do we provide access to daily products, daily medication for daily ailments to people who want to be empowered, who want to actually take more control over their health, which regulatory system should actually help you provide. So we're working with regulators, but not just regulators, but also multi-stakeholders in, in providing easy access to medication. That's one aspect. Then the other aspect is price control, which is a slightly different dimension of Sorry. So our first challenge is access, and then there's price control. I think here I would like to just say that I think there should be responsible pricing from the, from the industry. There is no question that industry has to be very responsible in pricing. But on the other side, we also need trusting relationship with government so that we can form an open, transparent uh, system of where the government says what kind of medication it wants to, to actually focus on from a price maintenance or price control point of view versus those that it believes providing greater access and providing the natural forces of competition mm. is both beneficial for consumers and beneficial for industry. So would you say the relationship so far has been an adversarial one? I would say the relationship can be a much more productive and transparent one. Okay, that's as far as price control is concerned. But on the larger emerging market piece, uh, the stated objective was that it should contribute 50% of your revenues by 2014. If my memory serves me right, you're currently at about 43%. So are you on target to be able to get to that 50% number or are you going to have to push it back a little? Well, I, I think first of all, we will have to push it a little. And the reason is twofold. First of all, we've done better in developed markets than we th thought we would be doing. Yeah. And that's all credit, I, I think, to my people because we really outperformed in developed markets. And the better you do in developed markets, clearly the equation goes, uh, you know, on one side. Uh, and I've always said that although emerging markets offer us a long-term opportunity for growth, what we need to forget, not forget is developed markets are still a very large and important part of companies. For my company, it's 55% and more. Many companies still 50 to 45% to 50%, right? So it's a huge part. People can't forget developed markets sure. and find uh, forget how to grow in those developed markets. So I'm glad that we are doing well in developed markets. Emerging markets have you know, has given us twin challenges. One is one based on currency. So simply restating our financials in emerging markets gives us a lower percentage contribution from emerging markets. And the second challenge is the current challenge of growth because you do see in a number of emerging markets growth rates have come down and things have started to toughen up although i'm as i said before i remain very excited about the future so why when do you expect now in the new context to achieve the 50 percent revenue target from emerging markets it if will, not 2015 if, if we continue to grow the same rate as we are growing we are going to get this in a couple of years later and i think there are other things that that will come into fray whether we make acquisitions along the way, what those acquisitions mean in terms of growth rates and balances between emerging markets and developed markets. So there will be a lot of those uh, issues too. But I think our direction is very clear. We want to grow our business in developed markets, but we also want to grow our emerging mar markets footprint faster. But so would that then be the inorganic strategy to really grow the emerging market footprint faster? Uh, no, organic, uh, organically we can grow our emerging markets much faster and are growing emerging markets much faster. And that, that will happen. I, th I think emerging markets will take a higher contribution of our business in the future. But there was another important KPI, if I may say, so key performance indicator yeah. that we have set for our business and our strategy, which is how big health and hygiene will be as a total company. So it's what, about uh, over 50... 55% both combined today? No, we said, we said actually emerging, uh, sorry, uh, health and hygiene should be around 70 odd percent to our total company by 2016. And it's and, currently And now we are already over 75%. Yeah, so. Over 75%. So our health and hygiene portfolio transformation has actually taken uh, place much faster. Mm. Uh, the company has become a bigger health and hygiene company much faster than we had originally anticipated, which is tremendous for our, our business. Are you done with the restructuring? Because you restructured the company basis, geographies and so on and so forth. But given the, the, the philosophy of moving towards being a health and hygiene company in terms of brands that you may want to let go of, I know some amount of that restructuring has already happened. Are you done or is there more to go? No, I think, first of all, we are living in a very, very fluid and dynamic environment around. And as a great man said before me, uh, you know, if companies are changing at a rate uh, which is slower than the world outside, their end is in sight. So I don't think our, our own internal change is, is done. We are going to continue to evolve as a company. 
We want to become a more connected company, a much more digitally enabled company. We want to create a company which truly cares about brands that matter and how we engage with consumers in the world consumers live in versus the cons world that we were born and brought up in. So we have to change still to keep pace with the world around us. You know, speaking of change, uh, you talked about connected technology and how that is going to perhaps also be part of the new strategy that Reckett Benghazi has embarked on. What is that going to mean essentially uh, from a monetization point of view as well? I, that's a very interesting question, which is how do we monetize this whole idea? Because I've talked about connected health and I've said that in the future, uh, the world will become much more connected, but even healthcare will become more connected. We've talked about wearable devices, but we've talked about mobile systems and how all of these enable people to take more control over their own health. People today want to find out what is wrong with them well before they visit a doctor. Yeah. And they want to find the answer and do something about it. Now the question is in the journey of this consumer, which starts from being aware of an issue or being worried about an issue, which might be ranging from a virus which is in the in the area to some very significant uh, disease that they have they have in the family or their uh, themselves i think that journey we need to understand how that journey actually will take place and to figure out rb's role in adding value across but that connected health journey. Be in, from a technology point of view, would you like to, for instance, get into a wearable device kind of category uh, sometime in the future? No, I don't think we will be into wearable devices and fantastic yeah, that things like example, that. No, but I think yeah. I'll give you an example, a tangible example. There is a platform in the US called WebMD. WebMD yeah. is a, as the name yeah. implies, yeah. the web doctor. Yeah. But it's really not a doctor. It's, it's a platform from where you can actually get a lot of information, including what's happening to different parts of the United States, for example, in terms of the kind of viruses there and what's happening to cold and flu there. Through so WebMD and the searches that take place on WebMD, we can figure out whether a, a person in Virginia is actually thinking and worrying about cough versus a person in Maryland, which mm. is right, right next to so target your brands better. We, exactly. Is, is worried more about yeah. cold and flu yeah. and other forms of, of uh, cold and flu. And based on this knowledge mm. and how many people are actually looking at mm. that information, we can aggregate what is happening in one part of North America versus another one. Mm. Where does it help us? First of all, it helps us in targeting better, mm. but not just in targeting our messages better, but also providing healthcare outcomes better, making sure that the stores have the right product at the right time so that when more people are looking for cold yeah. and flu in one area yeah. and cough in another, mm. we don't do the wrong way out. So I think a connected health company, a connected company can actually use data, can use Sorry. digital uh, technology to become a better company, to provide better uh, outcomes for patients and for people. You know, you said uh, how the developed markets are actually surprised on the upside and the emerging markets have shown you varying degrees of growth. Uh, uh, given that, for the year, will you be able to meet the revenue targets that you've set out for yourself or do you believe that you'll be at the lower end of that target? But we've, uh, the targets that we set were twofold. One was revenue targets of 4 to 5 percent growth in total and there were margin expansion of flat to moderate. So these were the two targets and investors focus on both the top yep. line and of yep. course the bottom line. In top line, we've said recently that investors should expect us to meet at the lower end of the four to five. five yeah. But on the margin side, we've said that we should, investors should expect nice margin expansion also in the second half. Now for, we expanded our margin the first half by 40 basis points, which we call nice. And I don't know what you, sh you should transcribe from what I just said, but I think we should do better than our original targets. Be better? We should do better than our original targets on margin expansion. So we've done quite a lot of work this year to, to become a better company, to become a more effective and efficient company. Mm -hmm. And I think that is good news for not just for 2014, but as, uh, also how we look at 2015 and the opportunity that 15 year and beyond presents to us. You know, uh
when you took over three and a half years ago, uh, there were question marks because you had pretty big shoes to fill into. And uh, you've proven the skeptics wrong. You've proven the critics wrong as well. What has been the biggest challenge for you? And you, you've done a pretty massive steering around as far as the company is concerned in moving it away, not away, but aligning it to a new different world that you see is going to be the big area of opportunity. What has been the big challenge for you in the course of this journey? Well, I think, first of all, as you rightly said, that when I took over three and a half years ago, I took over from a very, very successful CEO. Uh, but I was not, that was not the most daunting problem. The most daunting problem is not whether you could succeed or fail. The most daunting problem is that you have uh, the weight of uh, uh, 60 billion dollars yeah. of, uh, of, um, of investor money, yeah. 40,000 people, that's more mm. of a weight than whether you've taken over from a good yeah. guy or, yeah. or, or not yeah. such a good guy. And because that weight of expectation does not change, whether you've had a successful past or a, mm. or a, a less successful past. And I think, like I told you, our obsession was about how uh, over the next decade and more, RB will be positioned for a success that not just our past has defined, mm. but what we as a people in the company want. I think the most demanding aspect is mm. how do I make sure that the people who walk into my company every day mm. feel excited about the company they work for, mm. feel inspired by what we are trying to achieve, mm. and feel we, we are doing something very good. And I think that has been the biggest challenge and the biggest uh, driving force for me. You know, you set KPIs for the company and for your various brands, etc. What about KPIs for yourself or are they the same as the KPIs that have been set for the company? No, absolutely. I think one of the greatest privileges of being a CEO is that your individual objectives immediately get submerged with the objective of the company. I don't think I have a personality or a character or a, which is separate from my company. It is this, it becomes, this is the final point where these two things converge, merge, absolutely. So I don't feel I have a unique and personal objective anymore. So let me end by asking you, what to your mind is the single biggest challenge, whether it's global growth or risks, and what is the single biggest opportunity that you're looking at as a CEO today? No, I think our biggest challenge each day is to make sure that when our people walk in every day, they have the same passion and hunger for their work. Uh, the CEO's job becomes very difficult when the people who work for that company are not inspired. They don't have passion and hunger. They don't want to drive even harder mm. for success. So that's my ultimate challenge and thankfully, you know, this is what I find every day that inspires me. My people are back into work every morning. I feel hungry to go back every day and I think that makes my life so much easier and better. Well, Rakesh, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. We wish you the very best of luck with your plans in India and the rest of the world. Thank you very much for speaking to us here on CNBC TV 18. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Well, with that, it's time for us to wrap up the appointment. We'll see you again next week. Till then, from the entire team, goodbye and many thanks for watching. All right, that was Shireen in conversation with the big boss at Rekhid Ben Kaiser. That's where we take a break. Thank you for watching, but lots more coming up on CNBC TV 18.